right, good morning everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, Wednesday seminar where we um, have the pleasure of listening to uh, Anna Riddell. Uh, it's my pleasure to host this seminar. My name is Martin Wolf and I'm the branch head of Positioning Australia here at Geoscience Australia. Uh, before we proceed with this seminar, I would like to acknowledge that the traditional owners and custodians of the country on which we are holding this seminar and throughout Australia. And I would like to acknowledge their continuing connection to land, water, the sky and community. We pay our respect to the people, the cultures and the elders past, present and emerging. So the seminar today is, of course, one of our series of distinguished lecture seminars that we host. And that's an opportunity to highlight the real key achievements and um, contribution that this work makes to geoscience in Australia and across the world. And uh, very fittingly, today's seminar has um, charting new frontiers, harnessing global navigation uh, systems for local solutions. So that's that global contribution theme will come out very well. And who better to present today's lecture than Anna Riddell. Dr. Anna Riddell has been with Geoscience Australia for a long time now. She joined in 2012 as a grad and has uh, progressed through uh, various stages of work contributing along the way to our ability to position ourselves in Australia and across the world. Right now she is the director of um, the Global Navigation System, Satellite Systems Analysis section in the positioning branch, but she's also got other roles she works on the ICSM, the Intergovernmental Committee of Surveying and Mapping, as the chair of the Geodesy Working Group. And she is also the vice president of the International Association of Geodesy's Global Geodetic Observation System Committee. Uh, so all of this, no doubt, will shape how she will tell us about these charting, uh, the charting of the new frontiers around GNSS. And I'm very pleased to hand over to Anna to deliver this lecture. Thank you. Well, hello everybody in the room and thank you those that are also joining online. Um, I do want to say that although it's me up here presenting and my name on the slide, this um, collective presentation is representative of the body of work that's performed across different teams and different cohorts um, at Geoscience Australia and the Positioning Australia branch. So it's not, this isn't representing me, this is representing a whole bunch of work that we do at GA and the people that sit behind that work as well. Um, so Martine has already provided the acknowledgement of country, but um, I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and recognise um, the lands on which we're meeting today and wherever you're joining from today as well. So it's, I guess it's part of our human nature to want to know where we are, right? And it's our connection to the place and the space around us that helps guide who we are, where we want to go and what we want to do. And that connection to place and community is linked to our ability to position ourselves. Where are we? Where do we want to go? And how do we want to get there? Um, and we can do that locally, regionally, and globally. So getting from one place to the other in terms of navigation um, is an ancient art as well as an ancient science where some of the first navigators used the stars to guide them on their journey from one place to another. And then time, I guess, is one of those modern day constraints that we've placed upon ourselves, um, but one that which our modern day society would not be able to function without. So if we think the way that um, time transfer and time synchronization has, a, we have a critical reliance on that in terms of the way that our banking transactions are synchronized, the way our energy grids are regulated. It all relies on knowing the precise time at which those things happened. And global navigation satellite systems is one of the primary technologies that's helped delivering those capabilities to us. Um, and it pretty much it underpins everything that we do, but it's almost invisible. We don't recognise where and how that technology is help us, helping us go about our everyday lives. Um, and so today I'd like to take you through some of the examples of the work that we're contributing towards that um, hopefully help, help you realise where GNSS is and what it does. So global navigation satellite systems is a collective term um, for the satellite navigation systems that allow us as users to determine our precise location um, and the nature of the technology also gives us precise timing. Effectively these satellites are just giant orbiting atomic clocks with a few other fancy bits of electronics in them. 
Um, GNSS has been used for many things like navigation, um, mapping, tracking, um, whether that's real-time tracking of agricultural equipment that's helping provide our food, uh, or whether that's monitoring the plant health as the, the kits go about and, and do their jobs, um, or whether it's looking at real-time monitoring of water levels out at Gugong Dam, which is one of the primary water reservoirs for um, here, us here in Canberra. So some of the examples that I'm going to take you through today um, we'll look at current use cases for positioning and navigation technologies, but through the lens of the products and the services that we offer at Geoscience Australia. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to tease out some of the benefits that are there for everyday Australians um, that are enabled by these technologies. So there are multiple constellations that form global navigation systems. Probably the, the most popular and well-known one is the global positioning system out of the US, and that there are three other global constellations as well as regional constellations. So um, not to go into the detail, but most commonly when we talk about GNSS, we're talking about the satellite or the spacecraft, but there's also a set of ground infrastructure that supports the operation of that. Um, and then there's the data that we're getting from those satellites, which is the analysis and the part that we're gonna talk about a bit more today. So how have you used positioning, navigation and timing technologies in your everyday life? Have you used it today? Um, did you go for a Strava run this morning and, and log that with your smartwatch or your smart device? Are you planning to order Uber Eats to get your dinner tonight? Did you need to navigate using a map to get here to Geoscience Australia today? Um, there are a multitude of applications embedded in our everyday life that rely on location-based services, and the primary technology is GNSS that sits behind that. If you want to know where you are, or you want to know how to get somewhere, the first thing I do is pull out my phone and put it into Google Maps and get a navigation route to get to where I want to go. Um, but it's ubiquitous, and it's woven into our everyday lives, and it's uh, a technology that I would say that we take for granted, um, but that it, it makes our lives better, whether it's in efficiencies, in productivity gains, um, or just making life easier and our society more resilient. And the numbers are fairly clear on this if we want to look at economic benefits, so the impact of positioning globally. Uh, there was a study released recently out of the United States where um, since GPS has become openly available in the civilian sense, um, it's contributed $1.4 trillion to the economy, which is a fairly large number. And then if you take the inverse argument of that, if GPS were turned off for a day, um, that would be costing the UK economy at the level of $1 billion per day with the loss of GPS and these services. Um, nationally here in Australia, we've seen, um, we've done some economic benefit studies around um, the newer technologies that we're bringing online in the, in the form of an augmentation system called the Satellite Positioning Augmentation Network, or SouthPan, sorry, Southern Positioning Augmentation Network in SouthPan, um, where uh, using case studies as um, economic benefits, we saw a delivery of around $6.2 billion to the Australian economy over the next 30 years and equally investing in the national positioning infrastructure that helps you access that um, satellite signal from space and the technologies around it, around half a million, um, the half year, 500 million, sorry, half a billion over um, the next 19 years. But these numbers aren't accounting for the new innovations that are coming on board um, and to meet, I guess, the contemporary needs as we grow and as we discover new technologies along the way and how we can integrate GNSS with other technologies. So they're fairly, um, uh, smaller numbers when you try to think about the bigger opportunities that are out there. And so one of a, a really neat example of some innovation that we've recently come across um, has been with a company called Tiny Mobile Robots. So um, we were lucky enough able to go and work with this team a couple of weeks ago um, where I guess their driver is around making life easier for those in sporting organisations. So who has ever been a volunteer with a sporting organisation and had to go and mark out the lines of that sporting field? If I've done it, um, trying to draw a straight line, it's really hard. Um, trying to um, keep the paint in the tin, trying to just yeah, map out the boundaries and get the dimensions right, it's quite challenging. Um, and if you're having to do that on shared recreation ground where you're sharing codes, so you've got to change the marking lines or um, you're just marking it out fresh with no idea where the previous field was, it's, it's not an easy thing. So um, Tiny Mobile Robots have come up with the idea of why don't we create an autonomous system or a robot to do this that knows exactly where it is, 
and you can map out exactly where it wants to go. Um, and that's, that's what they do. They provide these robots um, that do paint, marking or custom logos, as the case might be here, which was for the National Positioning Infrastructure, um, which is a positioning capability that's provide unification um, of our infrastructure across Australia and allowing companies like Apteller to come in and, and on-sell those services as a high accuracy positioning service. Um, so that was a really neat example of how um, we're seeing the market adapt and adopt and accept some of the new challenges and the, um, the positioning, I guess, using positioning technologies to answer modern day challenges. Other examples of where we've seen precise positioning come into play are around um, cultural heritage management. So needing, there's a, an ask or the request for the ability to be able to map these areas accurately and precisely, um, but in remote and rural areas where sometimes access to communications to transfer that connection or access to um, the technology itself is challenging. And so there was a, the ability to take some of the new technologies that are coming online in Australia in the form of um, the South Pan signal and the South Pan service to reduce, um, I guess, the, the risk and the challenges around that um, and be able to map those areas accurately. Um, other examples we've seen are the integration of positioning with assistive technologies, so helping everyday people go about their everyday lives. Um, particularly those that need assistance, whether they be vision impaired or otherwise, um, having the integration of positioning technology and allowing them to navigate the world around them, um, whether that be a wearable device that gives them haptic feedback, don't go this way, there's a risk or a threat there, um, take your path another way. Um, we've seen that um, come into play and be used. But how does it all work? Right? So it's kind of, it's in our everyday lives, we use it. Um, but let's, let's go right back to basics. So I guess the idea is that there are these flying orbiting clocks that are transmitting a signal from space down to ground and we're able to receive that signal. But we need to know how far away those satellites are. And so we can use the distance equals speed and time calculation. Um, where the distance is we're trying to understand the range between the satellite and whatever you're trying to location or position. Um, but it's never this simple. There are a few caveats that we layer on top of this. Um, and when we're working in a three-dimensional space, you need to have access to a multitude of signals to be able to create the geometry and the trilateration needed to get a coordinate. And then you add the time dimension, you're looking at at least needing access to four visible satellites with good clear sky view. Um, the signals coming from space are reasonably weak, so you want to be able to see that satellite without obstruction. So I said that there are going to be a few caveats added on top of that equation, and we're not going to go through them all, but the idea is that you start to build out the complications of how you get this range from the satellite to the ground. Um, and these are signals that are weak um, and they undergo interference, or there are error sources that deviate the travel path of that signal as it travels from space down to us on Earth. Um, and whether they're to do with um, how the signal reacts to the charged particles in the atmosphere as it comes through the ionosphere and the electrons, um, whether it is the signal being deviated because it hits the wet part of the troposphere. These are what we as um, GNSS scientists consider to be error sources and so we're trying to identify them, model them, parameterize them and remove them so that we get a better understanding of the range and we can dampen down our uncertainty on what that final solution might be. But they end up being very useful to others um, that are interested in knowing how wet the troposphere is. Um, and so there are parts that we are taking for granted as the transmitted estimate of what those states are and there are other parts that we're computing on the fly. Um, and there are many different methodologies, many different techniques for how you can go about doing this. Um, and I'm not going to go into those today, but just to highlight that there are many ways to do one thing um, and that you can adapt and take on the fly and innovate as you go along. So we've talked about you need multiple satellites. We have access to multiple constellations that transmit signals across multiple frequencies. Um, and we have multiple ground observatories. And so we're starting to build the picture that you've got a whole lot of data out there to start to look at and analyze. 
Um, and uh, I just wanted to highlight that this is a really neat global effort. Um, so this is the network of the ground stations um, that are contributed towards the International GNSS service where data can be openly accessed from all of these sites around the globe as um, continuously operating sites that are, have, some have data sets that go back to 20, 20 25 years. Um, and so what do you do with all of this data? You've got it, um, great, you can probably get a position every day on your phone or you can navigate to where you want to go, but how do we start to crunch those numbers if we're looking for higher accuracy or higher precision um, down at that centimetre to millimetre level of where am I, where do I want to go, and what else can I understand about the world around me? So um, at Geoscience Australia, in collaboration with many academic and industry partners, we've been building a toolkit to crunch that data and crunch those numbers and understand the state of the space that we're operating in. Um, so Ganan is our precise positioning toolkit um, that runs off a precise point positioning algorithm. Um, it effectively takes all of those parts of the equation and bundles them together um, in a Kalman filter and spits you out the answer that you're looking for. And the simplest, uh, I guess, explanation is if you want to know where you are very, very precisely, you can use Ganan to crunch those numbers for you and spit you out a coordinate. But the beauty of Ganan is not that it will just spit you out a coordinate, it will help you understand other components of what we might consider to be error sources in our ability to determine a coordinate or where we want to go. And so GNSS can be used for meteorology. We're able to understand, um, because of the nature of the propagation of the signal from the satellite to wherever you're observing it on the ground or otherwise, the way that that signal is deviated as it hits the wet part of the troposphere can tell you information about how wet the troposphere is. And it turns out that that information is incredibly useful for if you're wanting to forecast the weather in your region. So what we might consider to be um, a nuisance parameter or trash and we're throwing it away or getting rid of it or trying to dampen out um, that interference, others consider that to be treasure. And so next time you are looking for your weather forecast map about how wet it's going to be and do you need to take your umbrella, you can thank GNSS. Part of that data goes into the data assimilation that goes forward for weather forecasting um, and we're routinely <laughs> providing that to the Bureau of Meteorology from our network of observing sites across Australia. And it's not just about what do we do every day, um, we get to do some experimental work as well. And so using Ganan as a piece of software, we were able to embed that onto a bit of hardware and send it to the edge of space on a slightly crazy mission where we wanted to understand how would Ganan operate and was it possible to get a profile as Ganan travelled underneath a weather balloon um, up to the edge of space. So we worked with Frontier SI and the Bureau of Meteorology to put um, our processing software underneath a weather balloon. Um, and this was an experiment where we needed to be able to recover and retrieve the experimental kit. Um, and so the map here on the left is the tracking data of the red line is where the balloon went on its journey um, after it was launched and released. And then also um, the, I guess, the support and recovery team as they chased the balloon, um, predicting where it was going to land. Uh, and so the, the image on the right is, I guess, the profile of how the balloon went up, and um, I bet you can guess where the balloon popped. Uh, and this is the data that we got out of it. So we were trying to understand as the balloon and as Ganan got higher, um, what did the zenith troposphere delay look like? So um, as an estimate of how does the troposphere change and um, pulling out the information from that. And it's, it, there's a really neat correlation. The red line is the balloon ascending. It pops um, just before we got to 30 kilometres in altitude and comes back down somewhat gracefully um, with the, the aid of a parachute. Um, and then the blue line is um, a representation of the delay of the satellite, of the um, GNSS signals that travels through the troposphere. So helping inform us about what's happening in that region, um, what's changing, how wet is the troposphere at a particular elevation at that time? Can we start to build on that case as, um, is that interesting information that can be used in other data assimilation models? Um, the other part of the experiment for us was testing out the software um, and testing out this bit of kit that we'd built. Um, how is it going to react 
as it gets higher in altitude and gets colder, is it going to um, have problems when the balloon pops and the payload starts to spin dramatically in a very dynamic environment? Is the software going to be capable of continuing to run or continuing co to collect the information in that, in that setting? So um, it was a very useful experiment and I believe it was a lot of fun. Um, and it has other applications and connotations when we start to look at positioning, not just on the surface of the earth on the ground, if you want to start positioning on platforms um, or other, I guess, other integrated with other technologies that are not just on the ground, whether they're heading to the edge of space um, and there's sort of precursors for looking at operating positioning in space or the edge of space. Um, I mentioned that we went and had a look out at some at the water levels at the Gugong Reservoir. So again, there's this gigantic reservoir of water. It's used for drinking water in Canberra. How do you know how much water is in that reservoir? Um, part of that is a collaboration working with the CSIRO and again, Frontier SI, helping us to answer some of these questions around, can we support calibration and validation activities, um, leveraging off the existing platform that CSI or CSIRO run out at Gugong Dam where they have a dark water inland observatory answering questions along those lines. Can they use that um, observatory to understand how to calibrate and validate the satellite altimetry data that's passing over that area? How can we help ICOM Water understand how much water is in that reservoir by providing the water level and relating that to the, I guess, the reservoir volume? Um, so again, we took a positioning kit with Ganan running as the processing software and put that on the pontoon out on the middle of Gugong Dam um, and used that to help us calculate the water height. Um, and what we saw was a beautiful match between the Ganan estimate of water height um, and the a benchmark water level data set out of Icon Water um, at that sort of uh, I think the RMS was close to it, the, the couple of centimetres level. So we were very impressed with this homegrown, home developed analysis technology and analysis kit that's capable of providing um, comparisons at the centimetre level. Um, and the idea with these, uh, what we've dubbed as Ganan in a box, which is Ganan software implemented on some hardware um, as an all-in-one positioning kit, is that we can continue to start asking some of these more involved questions around how do we know where we are? How can we measure position precisely? Is there an element to change and monitoring and edge compute that we can start combining with other technologies to inform solutions to problems that we don't yet even know exist? So we're going to... Um, change tack a little bit. So we've talked a little bit about the troposphere. We've talked about trying to use coordinate position for water leveling height. And this time I'd like to talk a little bit about um, understanding the ionosphere or more precisely the charged parts or the charged electrons that are existing in the ionosphere at the moment and how that can be useful information. So you may recall um, in 2022, there was quite a large underwater volcanic eruption um, near Tonga. And that volcanic eruption created a fair bit of chaos in the region and in, um, for a number of, of scenarios. But as that volcano erupted, it created a disturbance in the ionosphere that then moved. And that disturbance in the ionosphere eventually coalesced into a plasma bubble that hovered above Northern Australia. And you might think that's, that's cool, plasma bubbles, fun. Um, but what does that mean? And it actually impacted the ability to position precisely in that region while the plasma bubble hovered over that region. So um, you kind of think there was a dense cloud of charged electron content in that region and it caused larger deviations as that signal was trying to come from a satellite down to the ground and users were experiencing prolonged delays in their ability to get down to their required accuracy level. Um, and so this was some research that came out of colleagues at RMIT. Um, they used a bit of our Ganan software to crunch some of those numbers about pulling out the interesting parts of how is the ionosphere behaving. Um, and it's, it's along the lines of there are many factors that can influence your ability to achieve precise positioning. Um, and some of these you can't control. But if you have the ability to understand their impact and influence on what you're trying to achieve, you can start to work with them rather than um, fight them or, or be um, 
I guess, disturbed by what's happening around you. And I guess this, this is a link into some of the new techniques that are coming on board on the vein of we've got this plethora of signals and data available to us. Um, every time there's a launch of a new low Earth orbit constellation, we're seeing new technologies and new signals of opportunities come online as well. So the idea that we've got our regular constellation of global navigation satellites orbiting at that 22,000 to 37,000 kilometre mark in um, mid-Earth orbit, and, but then we're seeing these gigantic launches of smaller, more dynamic um, uh, CubeSat style launches of low Earth orbit. So you think of the Starlink constellations, which are much more about communication, but they all have, um, they all have GNSS receivers on board them. So you've effectively got a new observation network floating around in that low Earth orbit space. And they can be used again to understand how the ionosphere is changing, how the troposphere is changing, um, and providing signals that we can start to interrogate to ask bigger questions of. Um, and so the diagram here is trying to demonstrate that you've got your regular GNSS satellite and you can look at the bend of the signal as it travels through the ionosphere because you're receiving it at a low Earth orbit platform and then communicating or understanding that geometry back down on Earth as well. Um, and there are some incredible stats around um, sort of, I think it was um, the amount of data that's increased from about 7,000 observations per day in 2020 and there's now around 20,000 observations per day in 2022, and that is just going to grow exponentially as we see more of these low Earth orbit platforms come online. And all this is lovely, right? You can do all the intense amounts of calculations that you want, but if you don't know where the satellite is in space, it's, uh, you can't really do the range calculation. So another part of the work that we do is very much around trying to understand where that satellite is in space and what its trajectory is going to be. So we're looking at trying to determine very precisely what that satellite is doing, how it's moving, if it's experiencing changes, um, whether that be its angle to the sun or the gravitational effects that are influencing it as it orbits around in space. Um, not to pay too much attention to the squiggly lines, but that's to demonstrate that for every satellite in orbit that's providing navigation services, we're able to calculate where it is um, and predict its trajectory on its orbit at any one time. Um, and some of the comparison work that we've been able to do, which I think is just phenomenal. So these satellites are orbiting some 22,000 kilometres away, but we're able to compare our solution of where it is to an international benchmark at the 15 millimetre level. Just think about that for a moment. It, like, it still blows my mind that we're able to calculate where that satellite is way up up, up in space at the millimetre level. Um, and that, that to me is astounding and a testament to the work that has gone into developing this capability. Um, on the same vein, uh, part of this equation of trying to work out your uncertainty in a position is understanding the biases of the clocks and the receiver hardware that you're working with. Um, and so you've got these very, very good atomic clocks orbiting around in space, but they're always going to have some misalignment or some bias. Um, and we compare the clock time series or the clock data um, to that international standard as well, using our homegrown piece of software, and we're able to do that at the 63 picosecond um, comparison in terms of the difference, which translates, because I need to translate things to a distance measurement, because that's the way my brain works, to the 19 millimetre level. So again, being able to compare um, what is going on with a clock in space over 20,000 kilometres away at that millimetre level is phenomenal um, and kind of cool. So we've talked about kind of all the complicated, crazy stuff that goes into being able to determine a, uh, a position or a location, um, but how are we making that accessible? At Geoscience Australia, we have an online processing service called OzPoz, where users can upload the data that they've collected and receive back a report with a coordinate um, in the national datum as well as aligned to um, the international terrestrial reference frame, so the international alignment of, of all of that data. Since its launch um, in the year 2000, we've successfully had more than 2 million jobs submitted and returned um, in terms of uh, 
returned job or a finalised job. Um, and some of the use cases that we've seen are fascinating. So it's used very heavily in Australia. So that's what the plots here are showing uh, how heavily AusPos is used. So it's not just used in Australia, but used globally. Um, we've had the government of Greenland upload data for um, getting, I guess, um, trying to help them on their geological survey. So they've gone out, they've done a survey and they want to know where their equipment is or where their site of interest is. And they've got that processing report and processing done by us at GA. Um, there was a team that trekked up to the height of uh, up to the top of Mount Everest and took a GNSS survey. And so Ozpots has processed how high Mount Everest was, which I think is also fairly fun. Um, Ozpots is used for research into different processing algorithms. So you can compare our online service to other online services. Um, it's, it exists to provide accessibility to our national datum. So there are many users in the surveying and engineering world that need um, access or need data and coordinates provided to them in GDA 2020, and that's what OzPoz does. Um, we've seen OzPoz used um, in terms of improving survey control networks across various jurisdictions in Australia. It's used for monitoring oil and gas platforms offshore in Western Australia. Um, and we've even seen OzPoz being used for monitoring volcano deformation over in PNG. And so this idea of being um, providing accessible tools is what we're about at GA. So we do an awful lot of crunching and technical work in the background to make it easy for our users to access datum, to be able to access positioning services. Um, but none of this really works if you don't have good datums, if you don't have that underlying definition of latitude and longitude and the ability to align spatial data on top of it. Um, and the interoperable nature of positioning wouldn't be possible if we didn't have a solid supply chain that supports all of that. And so to make these datums and these reference frames and positioning and location services accessible, part of that is around understanding and contributing to the geodetic supply chain. And at GA, we play a part in every single piece of this supply chain. So we run the observatories, we're collating and collecting the data, we're analysing that data and providing back geodetic products and services to the users. And so GNSS is both an end user of the geodetic supply chain, but it's also a primary contributor to each of the components that go into building that um, spatial representation of our Earth. Um, and one of the primary roles that we play at Geoscience Australia is an analysis centre coordinator in the international realm. So as part of our contribution to the International GNSS Service, um, we're coordinating the different global analysis centres to bring those solutions together and provide global products out to the user community. So as an example of the data collection and the observatories that we have um, across Australia, this is a map of our, um, I guess, the, the stations that we're collecting data, archiving, bringing it in in a um, ubiquitous manner. Um, that's accessible via our data portal. Um, it's part of our national, sorry, I'm getting croaky, our national positioning infrastructure capability project, um, which was to unify data access across all of these observatories. Um, and so we provide the archiving and the dissemination of that data. We then take that data and we analyze it, and then we're providing products and services um, from that as well. And so to zoom in a little bit via our data portal, um, what we're seeing here is a zoom up of the site in Hobart. That's where I am I'm living at the moment. Um, and an example of one of the data products that's coming out of the analysis that providing. Um, and so this is a time series. So it's representing a solution every week at that site that's continuously collecting data. And that dates back to the early or the late 90s even. Um, and so you can start to build a picture of the useful information we're collecting here and how that can be used. Um, one of the first applications of GNSS in science was understanding how the Earth's shape is changing and deforming. Um, and we're still doing that today. So um, again, taking a GNSS time series, so data that's been collected continuously over a number of years at a site in Samoa, um, what you can see there is that there's quite a large change, and this is just in one component of that position, there's been a large change. And that's due to an earthquake happening in that area where there was physical deformation of that area. And the 
location information that you're receiving gives you an indication of how that position has changed over time. Um, and that is incredibly useful when you're trying to build a picture. Um, and we've been doing this data analysis for a number of years of what is the land motion at that site. And it's important because one of these sites, well, actually a lot of these sites, 13 in fact across the Pacific, are co-located next to tide gauges. And we know that tide gauges are one of the primary sources of information for understanding how sea level is changing. But if you're wanting to understand in an absolute sense how sea level is changing, you also need to understand how the land is moving to which that tide gauge is attached to. Um, and this is a project that we've been running for quite a while, providing that data analysis of the GNSS time series to help inform decisions locally around what is moving, what is changing, how can you use that to inform your decision making. And that's to say that everything is moving, right? In, in my world, nothing stays still. Um, with the observing network that we have access to and the data that's coming in continuously, we're able to track and understand how the Australian tectonic plate is moving. And that's important when we're starting to build a picture if we have, um, we can now get instantaneous positioning from global positioning systems or, or GNSS. But um, if that doesn't equate to a coordinate on a map, which is not moving, then how do you connect the two? And that's where our understanding of the tectonic plate motion and the link between the different datums and the reference systems starts to come in together. Um, and it's not all constant. <laughs> Australia isn't moving in a beautiful straight line, it's twisting as it rotates around an axis. And so you see different rates of movement across the country in terms of its horizontal motion. Um, and part of the product suite that we provide at Geoscience Australia is that model of motion. Um, and that helps inform how we maintain our datum, which is static. So coordinate is here and coordinate does not move. Relate that to a um, I guess a modern positioning technology using GNSS where everything moves and you're getting instantaneous position that you want to be able to connect back. And so that's the background to our regional reference frame and the densification in our, in our area. So we're trying to pull together the data from across our region, process that coherently and provide a solution out. And we're doing that every week. So every week, sorry, every week, yes, we're providing um, an updated coordinate at across 1,000 sites in our region. Um, and so that's an immense amount of data that we're processing and crunching to provide a coordinate and a velocity at each of those observatories um, across Australia, New Zealand, the Pacific, um, and other sites that contribute to our, process, our, um, our program. And we don't do that by ourselves. Um, this is a collaborative and combined effort. We've got other analysis centres across um, Australia um, and, and our region, um, and of course we can't do that without the investment in the infrastructure across our region either. Um, but again, there's an awful lot of data that's sitting there that's accessible. So if you're interested in pulling out those time series, if you're interested in answering the question of what is going on in my region, is it moving, that data is accessible to you. But how do you know how good your position is? Right? So it's, we know it's, it's complicated. You can upload data and get a result back, but how do you know how good that result is? Um, in some states and territories, there is a legal requirement to be able to connect to our national data in GDA 2020. Um, and at Geoscience Australia, we help to create that chain of traceability between the users and their operating data and the sites that they have to connect to to get their positioning correction services and connect that back to the definition of the datum in Australia. Um, and so we have a role within the national measurement system. Um, we're appointed as a legal metrology authority um, under the National Measurement Act by the National Measurement Institute. Uh, and we're providing that chain of traceability as a, as a version of position verification and certification to users that have that requirement. Um, and it's it's not something that we do lightly. We recognise that in a legal framework, this has got to be right. Um, and so we maintain an accreditation under um, the National Association and Testing Authority that helps us maintain a quality management framework that aligns with the international standards. So for us, it's incredibly important that we're able to provide that authoritative source of you are here with this uncertainty. Um, 
and that we expect that that will be maintained in terms of legal traceability. Um, and so at the moment we currently have 700 sites that are certified um, as a position by Geoscience Australia and we're the sole laboratory in Australia that's capable of doing that. And it turns out that there aren't actually many other countries that do position verification as a service. Um, so it's, it's a reasonably unique thing to Australia, but um, we're, we're quite pleased and proud to be able to offer that as a service to our community that has that requirement. Um, and GNSS, of course, is not perfect. It's like any other technology. It has foibles, it has vulnerabilities. Um, uh, the, the signal strength that's coming from those satellites orbiting at some 22,000 kilometres away is quite weak by the time it gets to us um, here on the ground. And there are intentional and unintentional sources of interference or vulnerability. Um, um, to touch on a few of the unintentional ones, the radio frequency domain is quite crowded around the, the signals that GNSS operate on. It is protected, but there are edge cases where it can become interfered with unintentionally. Um, and then there are the, I guess, uh, scenarios that can't be controlled, such as solar activity. We are not able to control how quickly the sun spits out a sunspot, but that interferes with our ability to position occasionally. And so Genesis is vulnerable. There's many efforts working to protect it, to mitigate against some of those vulnerabilities, um, but that would be a whole other talk that I'm not going to go into today. Um, what I did want to just highlight though was that um, this is something that we're also interested in and capable of, of understanding it at GA. Uh, does anybody remember the large geomagnetic, geomagnetic storm that happened um, a couple of months ago in May? So it was a Category 5 or a G5 geomagnetic storm, which is one of the biggest ones. Um, and essentially these storms occur when large, fast, moving, electrically charged masses or plasma are ejected from the sun. Um, they hit our magnetic field, sorry, and interfere with that magnetic field um, and um, again cause more charged particles to enter ionos out of the ionosphere and that interferes with the signal transmission and delay as it comes from space down to us. So what creates beautiful auroras um, ends up being a nuisance when you're trying to do precise positioning. Um, and there are cases where from that storm in May, um, there were cases in the United States where they had out outages and disruptions to their services in terms of being able to precisely position. Um, so this is an example from their augmentation service called WAS in the US where the plot on the left is normal operations. That was the day before the storm. They had regular coverage, which is the area in red. And the plot on the right is where uh, there's zero coverage. Their services were unavailable because of the geomagnetic storm and the interference that that causes with their ability to transmit the signal. Um, there's a, a great quote that was given to the New York Times along the lines of, the storm caused navigational systems and tractors and farming equipment to break down. So there were people that were in the middle of their harvest relying on GPS guided equipment, whether that was their tractor or other pieces of kit that just couldn't do their job any longer because they were so reliant on the GPS navigation aspect that their tractor just stopped. It went, no signal, I don't know where I am, I can't work. Um, and it's getting to the point where some of these systems are being built without driver capability. So <laughs> there are cases for where people are always gonna need to be involved when the technology breaks down. It's like in any other scenario, if the technology isn't gonna work, how do you, um, how do you get back to basics? To following off on that example, um, in Australia, the um, plot on the left is a normal, normal day in terms of the electron content that's around us. Uh, and the plot on the right was the anomaly that we saw come through when the geomagnetic storm hit. Um, and so this is trying to indicate that uh, there were cases where there were degradations to services in terms of precise positioning across Australia, but we didn't see the same outage that they saw in the US. Um, and that using our analytical capabilities of GNSS data, we're able to identify when these anomalies are happening um, and provide useful information again, how, how uh, to respond, how to react, what can be done in these scenarios. Um, and so 
I mean, GNSS is all around us. It's a, an accessible signal that we can log into um, and take advantage of, and it's in our everyday right lives. It, it is complicated. I hope that um, I've been able to show that to you, but it's not insurmountable. Um, and at Geoscience Australia, we're making it accessible through our products and services. Uh, and like with most other technologies, the key to its success is going to be its integration and its future use. So um, as we enter the age of autonomous vehicles that are relying on GNSS to help provide part of the equation that goes into the navigation and the positioning components, as we look to increase food production with our reliance on precision agricultural technologies, um, as we look to create efficiencies and productivity um, by being able to precisely locate where we are, it's not just GNSS as the sole contributor to that, it's going to be the integration um, and hopefully we'll get towards a resilient and successful society with that. Um, thank you very much.